Okay, we're live. This is uh, Think Tech Hawaii, if you didn't know, and it's Aloha United We Stand, if you didn't know, and it's 12 o'clock. Well, it's, it's, it's kind of a running 12 o'clock. My apologies. 12 o'clock rock. That's Sherry Coffey. He's a clinical director, we, we need to know exactly what that means, of IHS, and IHS is one of the most important uh, you know, organizations, institutions in the state of Hawaii right now, the Institute for Human Services. And it is saving not only its own constituents there uh, on um, Nimitz Highway, um, but all of us. Jerry, That's tell okay. us, tell us, say hi, and tell us what you do. Hi, Jay. Thanks for having me. So, gosh, I've been at the Institute for Human Services now just about five years, and in that time, what I have done as the clinical director is basically provide leadership and support um, for what is considered the clinical side of the house in a great big emergency homeless shelter. Uh, we have an administrative staff, we have our operations staff who basically uh, run the shelter on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, IHS, of course, is open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So we have a very large operational staff. Um, and then we have our clinical teams. And clinical teams or clinical staff at IHS basically means uh, about nine different kinds of case management and the Clinical staff at IHS are basically under the direction of about nine coordinators that are just below me, and then about 40, 45 staff um, who would be uh, paraprofessionals, uh, bachelor's level, master's level, nurses, uh, and a psychiatrist or two also as part of the mix. All trained, all professionals. Absolutely, yeah. yep. You said nine, nine, nine categories. Is that nine categories of what? Is that just an administrative division or is that division of how you characterize homeless? That's a good question. I guess what that would be referring to is roughly we have nine scopes of service. So there are several different, um, we're fortunate to be funded um, and to be chosen to be funded. Um, and so the- And one of the funders is Aloha United Way. That's correct. That's why we're here together. <laughs> but the other side of that coin is the more diverse your funding, the more diverse your services and scopes of service need to be. So we have a lot going on. So we basically have uh, nine or so programs that are under my uh, direction and I have a wonderful uh, team. I, I miss often uh, having direct contact with the clients that we serve because really most of my time and energy is really spent working directly and administering directly to um, an amazing group of clinicians and case managers and nurses and psychiatrists. Um, and we make beautiful music together. So I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to share in detail what it is that we do. They talk to you about their um, services to render and the conversations they have. Yeah. And you learn from that on, on a larger level, I sure. guess. You learn what really troubles people out there. What has, I think, been part of the secret of our success at IHS has been that I feel strongly that teams should cross-pollinate. So it is always the case that Members from one team within IHS are also bridging onto another team and et cetera and et cetera. And that way processes are much smoother uh, rather than people being um, kind of only knowledgeable about their department or their processes. Uh, everybody is a generalist at IHS. Any staff that works with me at IHS needs to be a generalist, which means they need to know a little bit about what everybody's doing because it's a very ambiguous and a very confounding population to, to serve. And so any time that we have the ability to have a homeless individual in front of us who might be motivated and ready uh, and capable at that time of making change in their life, whoever our staff are at IHS, uh, they need to be able to direct that individual in the right direction. You know, I, I'd like you to come back over and over again so we could examine exactly what you and they learn mm -hmm. about this population because we have to analyze these are these are people who are in our community like it or not mm -hmm. um and you know in our lifetimes in the last 20 30 years there's been a remarkable increase in homeless not only here but really all over america in every city i mean san francisco is a really good example right but in europe too yeah and i'm and to a lesser degree but possibly uh, you know on the same track is countries in asia and I, you know, I asked you before the show began, what, what causes this? We're, we're in a time now where homelessness is part of humanity. It wasn't before. Mm. What happened? That's a really good question. Hold a deep, Jay, that's one deep question. We're, I think we're fortunate to live in a beautiful island culture. And I think we're fortunate that our host culture continues to be very visible and that the host culture is still tangible um, for us. Native Hawaiian host Correct. culture. Correct. 
And I think one answer to your question is that the things that have sustained indigenous cultures and made it the case that indigenous cultures uh, continue across the planet to have core values and core understandings of what living in balance looks like. Um, I think that as a society and as a, as a world community, we are just for so many reasons getting further and further away from those basic tenets uh, that we still see represented in host cultures, which speak to balance, uh, speaks to inclusion, speaks to- Charity, kindness, generosity. That's correct. And, and again, inclusion. Um, everybody had a place at the table. Yeah. Um, everybody's um, identity mattered. Everybody had a role to play. Everybody was important. And so when you look at a homeless population, it's an incredibly complex and diverse subset of human beings. But one of the things that they have in common is grief. Um, it is grief a about what? Most homeless people have lost an incredible uh, amount of things that that the rest of us take for granted. They've lost relationships, they've lost careers, they've lost limbs, um, they've, they've lost, lost their health in general. They've lost their health in general. Um, of course, their dignity, um, it's still so there. So this is a grieving for that yeah. loss, yeah. those losses. When I facilitate our new employee orientations each month at IHS, uh, we have over, almost 150 employees at IHS. So we're constantly bringing new folks into the mix. And what I tell the operations crew as I'm kind of orienting them to what they're about to do relative to working in an emergency homeless shelter is that culture and ethnicity are important things to observe when working with any uh, marginalized or special population. But really the culture that I'm telling them to pay attention to is the culture of grief and the culture of PTSD, because those are the two uh, threads. Maybe in, in answer to your question, that is a, a common. PTSD, like in the military PTSD? Yeah, PTSD. Is that, and you're talking about it in the larger context. It's not just military guys who, who've been Absolutely. injured psychologically Absolutely. in war. You're talking about people who never went to war. Certainly vets. Um, yeah, I'm talking about the, the trauma that is um, a part of living in, as an unsheltered homeless person. Um, it is one of the reasons why IHS understood that the city and county's implementation of sit lie laws was logical. Because if you look at folks camping on sidewalks, what you see are children. And you also see vulnerable, elderly, mentally ill uh, adults. And so what I hope a coherent society does is makes a decision that that's not okay. And the reason it's not okay for children to be homeless, unsheltered on a sidewalk is because there's drug addiction and drug abuse and prostitution and um, it's not a good place. So PTSD is the result of being a victim of crime, um, having vulnerable, uh, being vulnerable to chronic medical conditions that just keep coming back. Um, yeah, it's not a fun existence. It's not what you were raised to expect. It's traumatic to find that your life isn't working the way you thought it would. That's correct. <clears throat> well, we talked before about, uh, you know, living in a complex world, more complex all the time, uh, you know, and, and the technology makes it complex. Um, and maybe some of the complexity that hurts people, that makes them homeless, that, that shows them that they can't cope. It makes it impossible for them to cope. Um, this complexity, um, it's a problem. And I, and I think you're right to say that the complexity makes for mental illness, and there's a relationship between mental illness and homelessness, and it's all this kind of I give up kind of thing. Mm. For one, or I don't even know what I'm doing, kind of thing. But the other point I wanted to uh, mention, going back to Daniel Ellsberg. Yes, sir. He is my model back in Manhattan in the 60s, I guess. He right. was a psychologist and analyst. Mm -hmm. And in those days, I grew up there then, in those days, there were analysts on every street corner. Mm -hmm. There were social workers and psychologists and psychiatrists and every, everybody you knew was engaged in some way. It was vogue. Like it. And you could go on your, you know, Tuesday at three o'clock weekly meeting or whatever it was, and you could talk to that person and mm -hmm. tell that person your inner thoughts, concerns, successes, failures, whatever. And that person was safe. Right. They wouldn't repeat what you said. Right. Um, that person w might offer you advice. That person would help you find your own strength. But that went away. There's no more Daniel Ellsberg. I mean, there's a, there's a few psychologists in the state, a few social workers, but I think they work for the government mostly. <laughs> well, I'm one. I, okay, have, a, I uh, have a private practice. So okay, okay well, I, I want to find out about that. <clears throat> but my, you know, my thought is that if we had friends 
that we could talk mm. to, tell them our most, you know, our innermost thoughts, right. and try to get what you call it friend therapy. Uh, we'd all be better off, and there'd be less mental illness in the world and less homeless. What I agree. I agree. What you're referring to is kind of two things: uh, people being isolated, and also disenfranchisement. So, kind of on the interpersonal level, it's being isolated from other human beings, and on a social level, it's being really disenfranchised from greater society and not really having the ability to participate or compete uh, in society. Unique to Hawaii, um, I think, and maybe this is in relationship to what you're noticing, um, Asian and Pacific Island cultures uh, it is very common that you have multi-generational households. I think we see this on the mainland as well, but I think it's perhaps more represented here um, because of the mix of cultures that we have. And so one of the things that causes people to become homeless is when the relationships in those intergenerational homes breaks down. Uh, you intermarry, uh, meaning you, you bring new people into the fold, and uh, it's very expensive to live here. Uh, the cost of housing could be a whole show in and of itself. So you have a lot of people cohabitating, and so there's a lot of breakdown of uh, those relationships, and those are often the reasons that people give for why they're coming to our front door or why they're presenting to an emergency room mm -hmm. uh, needing help because they're homeless is yeah. because the cost of living um, creates a situation where people will cohabitate and people don't always get along because everybody doesn't have good communication and coping skills. Um, so I think that that's a part of the equation that doesn't get talked about much. And I'm not talking about domestic violence. Of course, domestic violence would be a level or a, a point on the continuum where you would expect that people would move Cultural out. Cultural violence. Yeah, yeah, that could be <laughs> Cultural it. Cultural trauma. Right. You and know, of course, there's, the, there's folks from the mainland. I mean, it is not a myth that uh, folks from the mainland flock here. Of course, they have no support system. They have no... Right. But in general, Jay, you're right. W one reasonable assumption you could make about any homeless individuals that they have burned bridges and that they really truly lack the kind of support system that the rest of us might take for granted in the event that a tragedy struck and we needed that level of support. Right. They have it. They do not have it. Right. And, and in many cases, their primary relationship is no longer with their, pa their family or their people, but it's with drugs. Their, their drugs are a relationship. primary relationship is with a substance and not another human being. I want to talk to you about this all day and all night, <laughs> learning so much. Um, that's Jerry Coffey, clinical director, means he supervises the entire clinical operation at IHS, the Institute for Human Services. We're going to take a minute just to recover from what he was talking about, <laughs> and we'll come right back. <laughs> Hi, I'm Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist here in Hawaii, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, which is on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock. Have a great summit. Take care of your mental health. Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you get excited about my new show, which is Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. We're going to broadcast on Tuesdays. 5 p.m. here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha, my name is Josh Green. I serve as senator from the Big Island on the Kona side, and I'm also an emergency room physician. My program here on Think Tech is called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'll have guests that should be interesting to you twice a month. We'll talk about issues that range from mental health care to drug addiction to our health care system and any challenges that we face here in Hawaii. We hope you'll join us. Again, thanks for supporting Think Tech. Jerry Coffey, you know, one of our directors, a very caring man, uh, and he's not Hawaiian, he's Japanese, uh, wrote a piece and he circulated around the, some of the other directors. It was about this Hawaiian notion, uh, going back to his own father back in 1900 or so, where uh, you pass by a Hawaiian house and they offer you food. Right, or water. Or water, and you sit at their table. Uh, I don't know if that happens so much anymore. Maybe they're not even in a position to do that for you. Mm. Uh, I remember Oz Stender gave a talk for us a few months ago, and he said when, when he was a kid, oh, well, they had nothing. Right. And um, anyway, point, the point being that deep in the Hawaiian culture is this thing about generosity and helping people uh, for no reason. 
uh, just to just to be kind and generous because it's the thing to do the thing to do it's part of the culture right. that's what you do and I, I think we, we have lost that or we are losing that and we really have to focus and try to regain that not only on an individual household level but on a, on a community level right but let's go to uh, let's go. Are you aware of the meaning of the word nanakui as a place name? No, what? Nanakui in Hawaiian means to look down, and the reason why nanakui, as I understand this uh, story, is that it is such a dry place that back in the day, when Native Hawaiians were traveling by foot through that district, because there was so little water, the residents of nanakui did not have water to offer, and so out of the shame that they felt that they could not extend that very common. Uh, expected human giving, um, they would look down in shame and avoid eye contact. And to this day, Nanakuli continues to have that name. Wow. And in reaction to that, the elementary school, Nana Ikapono, was specifically the name that they chose for that elementary school, which means to look at with righteous conviction. Wonderful. Isn't that a great story? It is. It's a great story. Think tech, we got it all. <laughs> so, Jerry, we wanted to talk today about the, uh, the, the medical problem. And you have a, uh, uh, a medical, uh, what is it, a medical halfway house kind of thing where you recover people uh, who are homeless and who, you know, have been, have been in, in institutional medicine and, and need help in order to extract from that and, and have a more reasonable medical life. Talk about it. For many years, um, the Institute for Human Services and Queens Medical Center have had a very symbiotic relationship. Um, in a given week, uh, myself and our nurse, uh, Elizabeth Glenn, we will clear anywhere from five to 10 or sometimes 15 hospital referrals uh, just out of Queens Medical Center alone. Uh, that would be referrals of individuals coming into our emergency shelter from emergency rooms, uh, from inpatient hospital beds, and also from psych beds, psychiatric beds. Uh, of course, we receive referrals from just about all the other hospitals as well, but because Queens carries the state of Hawaii on its back, the majority of homeless individuals uh, are expedited to Queens. Um, what we notice... And medicine is more expensive when that happens. Of course. If you, if you have regular medicine and screening and checkups and whatnot, um, it's not nearly as expensive as you take every problem to the emergency room. That's exactly right. And where do most homeless people go for their primary care? They to go the to emergency the, the room. emergency room. So what I just noticed, um, and in regular dialogue with Queens, you know, I'm on a first name basis with practically every social worker and some of the ER docs and certainly the psychiatrists at, in Queens. There was a very distinct subset of homeless individuals with chronic health conditions that we kept seeing cycle through our shelter and the street and the hospital. And these were folks who, as is often the case, have cellulitis, which is a uh, condition that's associated with diabetes cellulitis can become infected and the therapy for taking care of infected cellulitis is very long and, and entailed. It doesn't go away right away. It doesn't. And it's so, a serious chronic bacterial infection. It is and you can lose limbs and many homeless people that you see with amputations are for that reason. Uh, when folks like you and I go to the hospital for our IV antibiotic, which is the prescribed treatment for severe uh, infections, when we are medically cleared to leave the hospital, we may not actually be done with our course of IV antibiotics. So what would happen is you and I would go home and we would take all that expensive stuff out of the hospital room with us, our little buckets and our tissues and all that stuff we paid so much for, and we would have follow-up care. We would have follow-up appointments at an IV infusion center. Um, and maybe if we had a really hot rod health plan, uh, our infusion would come to our home, and we would have four to six weeks so of a fusion of, of high-tech antibiotics. Correct. To deal with the bacterial infection. Correct. Homeless individuals don't have that option to go <clears throat> home to some place to complete that course of treatment, and often, uh, having been in a hospital before receiving that treatment, will leave the hospital AMA, knowing that this is uh, an infection that has been resolved mostly. Um, it's clean. Um, I've had a few weeks here, I feel nourished, I feel better, <clears throat> and of course there is a relationship perhaps with drugs and alcohol, um, and they will leave the hospital, and so there never really is any resolution of that chronic health condition. Yeah. So what Queens... It can, it can be life-threatening. It too. certainly can. And let it go and go. <clears throat> and this particular uh, diagnosis is not the only one that we see coming into our medical step-down house. Um, there are others. But I want to back up. And so the name of these two homes, so what IHS has done is we've contracted now with Queens Medical Center and also Castle Hospital. They purchased beds. These beds are in two homes. One home is in uh, Kalihi, 
uh, and the other uh, home is located in Makiki. Uh, each are eight beds uh, apiece. And folks are discharged then from Queens or Castle Hospital into these two medical step-down houses when the alternative for them would have been just to go back to the street. But IHS is sort of um, managing this, yeah? Absolutely. We are responsible for 100% of the operation of the two homes. Mm -hmm. What happens when folks are released from the hospital, just like if you or I were released from the hospital, there would be home health supports that we would need, and our health plan would pay for those, and the hospital discharge planners would arrange for those. And so what IHS has basically done is we've created two homes. We call it Tutu Burt's house. Uh, Claude Dutil, uh, who was the gentleman who founded IHS, yes. his wife was Alberta, uh, and her nickname was Bert. Uh, and Claude, of course, has passed on, but Bert is still very aware of what we're doing. She's involved in these step-down she, houses. She's not directly involved. She's on the mainland, actually, but um, she keeps up on what we're doing, and we love her, and we keep her posted. And so we thought, let's name these houses after Tutu. So Tutu Bert's house. Perfect. So when those individuals leave the her hospital and they come into either of these two homes, all of the skilled, which would be nursing, and non-skilled uh, services that they would re require in order to be maintained in that environment, it's all provided by home health agencies um, and paid for by their insurance. There are three winners. Actually, there are four winners in this scenario. Um, and it has been incredibly successful, and we have had amazing positive outcomes. One winner, um, of course, is our client. During the time that they're in the house for a period of four to six weeks, we are able to link them to housing. That is something that they maybe had so not. Yeah, yeah you're, you have an opportunity we to really an, work closely with them that's now. That's exactly correct. They're captive. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> correct. Uh, quite literally in some cases. They also win because for many of those people, it could be the first time in their adult life, having come out of a 30-day or a 90-day hospital stay into our home, it might be the first time that they're clean and sober for the first time in a really long time. Yeah. So it's an opportunity for them to move on, that, on those stages of recovery from contemplation to action. There's pre-contemplation, contemplation, action, and maintenance. That's yeah. how people recover from addiction. Yeah. And so we're really getting them in a, at a point when they might be ready to be in action. The other winner in this equation are the and hospitals. And the people around are gonna to listen to them. My thing about they should have someone to talk to. They need to talk yeah. to that guy in New York City that you were mentioning <laughs> earlier. When I hear the debate about Obamacare and I hear people who may or may not understand the real costs and realities of medical care in the United States and health care, um, I become very frustrated. Um, hospitals are suffering. Um, Queens, We've seen some of them go out of business. Queens <laughs> and Castle um, have struggled uh, to have adequate reimbursement uh, for our sickest and most vulnerable and most chronic utilizers of emergency rooms. That's federal reimbursement. Correct, and inpatient hospital beds. Um, so for a large facility like Castle or Queens to be able to expedite an individual out of an inpatient bed to a lower level of care, and despite the fact that they're paying for that, insurance companies are not paying the bill for people to come to Tutu Burt's house. The hospitals are so motivated to move those individuals along that they're willing to pay for that themselves because the cost associated with bringing them to our medical step-down house is a fraction of what that hospital is eating on a daily basis. Right. An inpatient hospital day can be anywhere from fifteen to $2,500 a day. Right. And, and, the hospital and that's a national figure. The hospital has no choice, you know, if in the absence of a step-down house, right. you, just know, you can't put them on the street. And so that here's the other cool. winner. Yeah. The other winner is IHS. We are able to uh, address a housing need for our most vulnerable homeless individuals. Um, so it's been a wonderful opportunity. Part of their services during the time in the house is we have a case manager, Tiffany, she's, the, she's amazing. She's dedicated 100% to the uh, folks who come to us from those facilities to try to get them ho a housing subsidy. In some cases, she's getting them their picture ID, helping them to get their birth certificate, and just doing all those initial steps that are required to get people linked back to benefits and then eventually to housing. Are the two houses sufficient for the number of people who could qualify? Um, no, they're not. What are not. you gonna do about that? We have, uh, since the day we opened, Tutu Burt's one in Makiki. Here's a picture in of Kalihi. them. Yes, there it is. Yeah, looks pretty good. It's, it's beautiful. Um, we've been approached by insurance companies. We've been approached by every other major hospital on the island. Um, at this point, it's just kind of a capacity issue for IHS. Um, of course, we staff the homes 24 hours a day. We provide all of the food. 
Um, we often will um, find that we need to make the homes ADA accessible oh, sure. um, because that's the population that we have. And there's a little cost for us in that. Uh, there's cost for us in all of that. Um, you know, one of the difficult things about running an, an emergency homeless shelter and programs related to that is that we need to be staffed 24 hours a day. Most emergency homeless shelters uh, do not staff up 24 hours close a day. Close up at sundown. Correct. But IHS, we, we're open all day, and I think we have good outcomes because we you have access to, to our that. clients. Yeah. So if I wanted to build a third step-down house, what would I need? What would you need? Well, gosh, that's a great question. Like anything having to do with homeless population, what we would need is a landlord or a property manager um, who was open-minded and sympathetic um, and willing to partner. Uh, we've been fortunate. Uh, we have several facilities outside of our emergency shelters, so some of those nine programs I was referring to. Um, but first, we would need uh, somebody who owns a home uh, to come forward and offer their home. Um, and oh, we have a rental kind of a Correct, rental. of course. We would become, IHS would be the, come the tenant and we would pay the rent, obviously. Um, and again, to the extent that we would need to make modifications, we, we do good work, we do quality work. Uh, the, the home that you just saw, we buffed out both kitchens, we buffed out both bathrooms. Um, this was a landlord in Kalihi that's smiling from ear to ear. Has it improved um, the quality of oh, his property? <laughs> considerably. Um, so yeah, we need partners. Um, but I have well, to. But I have to say, you have, a, you have a cookie cutter kind of thing going on. But before we close, we have to close. Um, I just want to. I, I want to say, uh, and you, you can respond. But uh, you missed one. You missed the beneficiary. The taxpayer. Well, the public, the community, yeah, yeah. all of us, me, for example. That's right. And we really appreciate that. You're welcome. Thank you, Jerry. Jerry Coffee. I thank you every day. Mahalo. <laughs>